what we're going to do is basically um, draw on work that we are doing in the context of the project that um, Lehman just introduced. The, it's called Digital Urban Development and how, how large digital corporations shape the field of urban governance. I use the term DigiGov when I refer to it. The aim of this is to explain how large digital corporations such as Amazon or Google influence urban governance and development. It's an enormous project, um, and we're looking at city, city regions confronted in one way or another with LDCs. And right now we're working on Arlington, Alexandria, or otherwise known as the Washington metropolitan area, Seattle, Toronto, Amsterdam, and Groningen, Luxembourg, and Kiev. And before I, went to, before I continue, I also just want to add that we're not alone on this project. I am the leader, but we also have Marcus Hesse and Olga Krivitz who have joined us, and we have two master's students with us who also work on this project. So it's enormous in scope, but we also have a lot of people. So we're going to try and bring together some stories, but we've got of our research so far and preliminary observations of what we think might be going on. What we have so far is this idea of that led LDC urban development seems to have two faces. One is the symbolic flashy representational spaces that receive massive media attention, such as Keyside in Toronto or HQ2 in Arlington. The second is the less attractive, less talked about infrastructural encroachment of data centers, such as the hyperscale data centers projects in the Netherlands and in Washington metropolitan area where data centers have become particularly controversial in recent years. For us, these agendas invoke a couple of strands of urban studies literature, technocratic managerial, manager, managerial, managerialism, <laughs> policy mobility and failure, and urbanization through the digital growth machine. I'll get back to these more depth later towards the end of the presentation to reveal and or how they lead us to think of LDC-led urbanism as a strategy, but we'll first go through some of the broad um, stories that we've been investigating in the past few years. I will start with Alphabet. Um, DigiGov grew out of a previous project that looked at Alphabet's project in Toronto called Keyside, um, and which can be understood as an LDC representational so symbolic space. As urban geographers at the time, what really grabbed our attention is that Keyside signaled something new in urban studies. And it wasn't the flashy new gadgets that we were interested in that were being talked about, although it was that too, especially the um, all those digital centers, sensors that were being unleashed in the environment um, that were basically turning living spaces, wanting living environments into data extraction fields. We have Shoshana Suboff to thank for that analysis. But mostly we were drawn by the fact that there was a new kid in town in urban development. The usual sub suspects in urban development, at least in Toronto at the time, were planners, architects, landowners, developers, and so on. Um, but suddenly, in this case, we had a corporation whose enormous capital power dwarfed existing actors and institutions in the field, including developers who were, pop who were making condos all over the place. And moreover, it was claiming urban development expertise without having any at all, actually, and doing so by showcasing the grab bag of digital innovations, grandstanding curated events of pseudo participation, and widely advertising how it had the um, approval of all levels of Canadian government. So this seemed like a new situation, and at least we wanted to know how Alphabet had changed the field of urban planning in Toronto and what the impacts of that might be. So the story of Keyside, you may already all know it now. It's a rather old story, and in many ways, it's kind of 2019. It's a story from a different past, you know, pre-pandemic, the pre-energy crisis, and at the heart of this, at the height of the smart city craze. But it is useful to remember that at the time, it was a media extravaganza about how Alphabet was going to build the most amazing digital city ever, and that it would place Toronto's waterfront on the. Um, as one of the greatest text on the planet, planet's best tech, tech hubs and so on. And ultimately it failed as well, ostensibly because of the pandemic, but maybe because of activist pushback, we, we don't actually know. Um, but what we do know is that Keyside occupied Toronto politics for about two years before disappearing altogether. I'll turn now to Amazon. 
Amazon.com's headquarters are another set of what we could think of as symbolic digital cities that also receive broad media attention. The spheres, you may know them in Seattle, they were hyped for their architecture, while the urban competition for HQ2 generated media attention. Amazon.com campaigned that it needed a second headquarters to accommodate its strong growth, and it it thus asks city to call cities for a, in a call for proposals to compete for this HQ2's new location, promising an investment of five billion and employment opportunities for a workforce of up to fifty thousand for the winter. It received two hundred and thirty-eight declarations of interest from cities around the um, continent, and of these, twenty were shortlisted. And Amazon asked for another round of applications from those shortlisted to find with even more detailed survey of the city's main lo locational advantages. And in the end, Amazon chose two winners, which some were not particularly surprised by. One location was Queens, New York City, and which failed. Like Keyside, HQ2 in New York City also encountered substantial pushback. 50,000 new workers in the city would have posed a strain on the already difficult housing market and transit infrastructure. The public also wasn't too happy about the city's proposed billion dollar subsidies to Bezos of all people. And there were concerns about how the city treated the Amazon like a partner um, in respect to decision making. The city, for example, um, gave public property without demanding the uniform land use uh, review procedure. Um, so, and some also complained that the New York City Council was also excluded from key decisions. Ultimately, on 4th, February 14th, 2019, the firm retreated from New York City, and this project is no longer. The second location, which is now under construction, and you can see it on the screen, is behind schedule, is in Arlington, Virginia, which is a suburb of Washington, D.C., where Bezos already transformed an old textile museum into his personal D.C. residence approximately two years prior to the announcement. And just a note about the picture, what you see there is the site of where this famous architectural of the twirling helix called the ice cream cone um, is supposed to be built. So as you can see, it's not there yet. The picture is a little bit unfair, though, because behind me is the Met Park and the, this, the new buildings that have been built there. It is about half done, you can say, and the place is crawling with workers, but it's behind schedule because we're not in 2019 anymore. We have home office issues, or that's what Amazon is faced with home office issues. It's faced with economic problems and construction costs and so on. So there, are, the project is delayed. Anyway, these procedures we argue are symptomatic of how amazon.com proceeds with site selection. The call for tender was essentially a means for getting cities to do the work, considering location and screening information that amazon.com could use for other purposes. Second, Amazon effectively tested the competencies of local administrations, for example, to see how fast administrations could respond to their um, demands in tight take time frames. So now I'll turn it over to Karin, because she'll talk about data centers and move to the side of the pond. Thank you, Connie. Hello, everyone. Um, so, less often discussed in the media are the various physical spaces that LDCs require, uh, data centers and satellites, and in the case of Amazon, there are also fulfillment centers that are gaining increasing attention and in how they are changing labor and quality of life. My PhD research focuses on data center development, so I will discuss two locations where Google has existing or planned data centers, the province of Groningen in the Netherlands and the commune of Bissen in Luxembourg. Uh, in 2014, Google chose the port area of Emshaven in the province of Groningen to implant its first hyperscale data center in the Netherlands. It was the fourth in Europe. The availability of energy in the port area is touted as one of the main reasons for data centers to settle there. To the north of Google's data center, there are power plants owned by different companies, namely NG, Vattenfall, and RVE. The NG and Vattenfall power plants produce electricity from natural gas, while RVE produces electricity from hot coal and biomass. Renewable energy is also in abundant supply there. There are offshore and onshore wind farms in the port area. In addition to these, the largest solar farm in the Netherlands, owned by Eneco, is located approximately 20 kilometers south of uh, Emshaven. This solar park has a 10-year agreement with Google to supply all of its electricity to the data center in Emshaven. The Cobra cable, a subsea connection to Denmark for renewable energy imports, um, lends 
in the port of Emshaven as well as the uh, Nordnet undersea cable, which imports hydropower from Norway. According to the port authority, uh, Groningen seaports, in total, approximately 8,000 megawatts of electricity is available in the port area. So Groningen is now set to become the primary hyperscale data center hub in the Netherlands, following the decision of the Dutch gov government to limit hyperscale data center construction to Emshaven in the province of Groningen and Middenmeer in the province of North Holland, thus eliminating the possible competition of other regions wanting to attract these hyperscale data centers. The Netherlands had been attempting to control data center construction and resource consumption since 2019. Uh, due to the pressure on the electric grid that data centers created, a moratorium on data center constructions was instated in July 2019 in the Amsterdam metropolitan region. The focus then turned to hyperscale data centers as opposition from local groups grew when Microsoft sought permits to expand its data center in Middenmeer and Facebook sought to build a large facility in the municipality of Zeewald. The Dutch government thus imposed uh, a moratorium on hyperscale data centers countrywide in February 2022. Uh, the 2020 NOVI, so the National Strategy on Spatial Planning and the Environment for the Netherlands, had already cited Emshaven and Middenmeer as preferred locations for hyperscale data centers. Um, but the 2022 nine months moratorium put on hold all new building applications in other parts of the country until the legal design is worked out with the various uh, local authorities. So, and observing the opposition that Microsoft faced from local activist groups in Mid and Mayor, Google canceled its plans to build three further data centers there, in addition to the one that it already has in this location. Google has now announced two data centers in the province of Groningen in two separate locations uh, shown on the screen in Westport and in Wintroten. Len has already been earmarked for data center construction in Oostpolder, located to the northeast of the city of Groningen. Um, the region is now welcoming the renewed attention from LDCs, hoping that uh, uh, they will bring um, a help to boost the economy after the decline of the gas industry. According to the Dutch Data Center Association, data centers contribute 1.5 billion euros to the GDP, um, and the data center and cloud industry attracts around 20% of all foreign direct investment in the Netherlands. Uh, Connie, can you please change the slide? So the second location that I have been looking at is the village of Bissen in Luxembourg. Uh, the 33 hectares plot purchased by Google in 2017 is located in an industrial park where the Luxembourgish government has been developing an innovation hub. Uh, the project was announced uh, shortly after the former Minister of the Economy, showed here uh, in the photo. Uh, Itzian Schneider met uh, Google co-founder Larry Page at the Breakthrough Awards in December uh, 2016. Um, there is next to the Google site an existing data center uh, which houses since 2021 uh, Luxembourg's new supercomputer, Meluxina. Uh, the map also shows how the large 33 hectare site uh, is, uh, can be compared to the inhabited part of the village. And the 3D uh, drawing submitted by Google um, shows how the proposed buildings of the data center actually dwarf the already large industrial buildings on the site. Uh, it has been nearly seven years now since the Google Data Center project became known to the public, and there are now doubts as to whether it will be realized. Even though Google has been silent for months about the future of the data center, the Luxembourgish government still shows unwavering support for the project. Uh, we can recall a call, um, a quote from the Prime Minister of Luxembourg, Xavier Bettel, in December 2021, uh, when asked whether Google's data center in Luxembourg was on standby, he replied the following, the Google project is not on standby. It remains a priority for the government, in particular because it will support efforts to diversify our, our economy, and also because it is part of the development of a digital economy in Luxembourg. So, even though details about water consumption and noise pollution remain vague, the project is still stated as a priority for the government. The choice of Luxembourg for a hyperscale data center is something of a mystery. 
In the small country, land is expensive and in short supply. The country imports most of its electricity from neighboring countries. The first phase of the project would have consumed 7% of national power, and the second phase would have used 12%. The electric grid in its current state would not have been able to support the second phase of the data center and would have required significant expansion. The amount of water that would be required for cooling and whether this could be easily uh, obtained for the data center also still, still remains unclear. The application documents for uh, initial permit approvals were vague about important details regarding the project, but nonetheless, all approvals have been obtained so far. The project has been shrouded in mystery from the beginning. A moratorium and a, a memorandum of understanding was signed between Google, the Luxembourgish uh, government, and the Commune of Bison uh, at the time of purchase uh, of the site for the data center, but it remains secret to this day. Uh, Move More Ecologic, uh, a nonprofit organization which opposed the project, uh, sought access to this MOU through the local administrative court, but eventually lost the case. The vote for the initial approval for the project also caused a series of resignations at, at the commune, including the mayor himself. The new mayor, who initially voiced uh, concerns about the project when he was a councillor, now fully supports the project. Uh, Google's continued investments in Belgium and the purchase of a new plot for a data center in the region of Wallonia has shed doubt as to whether the Luxembourg project will go ahead. Um, so. These cases show how data centers built by LDCs pose societal risks for at least two reasons. It has been shown that uh, their needs are placed in direct competition with residents for resources such as affordable property or uh, drinking water. And secondly, uh, their construction is often the product of less than transparent deal makings with local governments. Uh, Connie will now discuss our conclusions so far. Connie, you are muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so what we're trying to do now is um, draw, we do try to draw on urban studies literature to try to help us make sense of some of these stories and some of these observations we've had. And I'm going to just go through some of them now with you. The first one is, um, what Reiko and Savini in 2019 wrote about called technocratic manager managerialism, which is a mode of planning that promises modernization and entrepreneurialism while muffling political conflict and going hand in hand with the privatization of planning practice and shifting knowledge production and capital power to those spheres. These stories, we argue, are reflective of technocratic manager managerialism, both driven both by LDCs and governments alike. It's important to stress the latter. Um, further, we are, we've also observed that LDC seem to be kind of modern day technocrats. You have on the screen Robert Moses, which we talk about in a paper. Um, if one looks at the behaviors and styles of urban governance of American tech giants of the earliest of the mid 20th century, um, one can con conclude that there's actually nothing new or innovative about Google and Amazon at all all pushed for a certain spatial development, which for some represented the height or state-of-the-art innovation and modernity of their time. Um, and they did so by power brokering, power brokering and bullying the field. There's a lot, there's Robert Moses, there are volumes written about him and his style. This is I highly recommend, this is very rich literature to, ex, to explore, but the parallels to Amazon and Google are, are really rather in, instructive. Um, another branch of urban studies literature is, is policy mobilities developed by Temenos, McCann, Peck, Ward, and others. This body of literature examines where policies come from and how they circulate around the globe. Uh, on the screen, what you have is a quote from McCann and Ward who explain policy mobilities. The concept is it's, it's a little bit like policy transfer, but a bit more, uh, more developed. They say, the policy world seems to be in constant motion. In a figurative sense, policy makers seem to be under increasing pressure to get a move on. 
um, to keep things within the latest trends and hot ideas and sweep them into their offices to convert those ideas into locally appropriate solutions and roll them out. Contemporary policy making at all scales, therefore, involves the constant scanning of the policy landscape via professional publications, reports, media, websites, blogs, professional contacts, and word of mouth ready made off the shelf policies and best practices that can be quickly applied locally. This is the idea that the whole policy world itself is in motion. Um, the idea, the concept was developed with respect to things like business improvement districts or new urbanism. One can see how these ideas are being imprinted around the globe. But we can also think about them in terms of smart city agendas or tech hubs, or more specifically things like Silicon Glen in, in Scotland or Silicon Luxembourg as well. This is the idea that one can simply replicate Silicon Valley, whether it's a good idea or not, elsewhere without respect to context. Conversely, the policy mobilities literature also allows us to examine how policies fail. And this is a branch of the policy mobilities literature that explains why failure is not a coincidence or an accident, rather it serves important functions. Failure is dialectically entwined with urban governance, a component of the process of trial and error through which policy is made. Policy it, failure is a means of subversion and an opportunity to advance alternative agendas. That's how Temenos and Lauerman describe it. Striking about Ariana's face are the trends with respect to mobility and failure of urban policy agendas. On the one hand, there's failure that despite the media fanfare, both corporations bailed on their projects in Toronto and New York and, and it's slugging in it's, it's, it's behind schedule in Arlington. And yet for both LDCs, failure was beneficial. The projects were a means of information gathering, testing the waters, weakening their adversaries, and advancing their own agendas. Failure was also a kind of bullying as seen as city administrations wasted time and monies trying to respond to the demands of Amazon and Alphabet, all under public spotlight too, for that matter. On the other side of the Janos face, data centers are being built in rapid pace. The material embodied spread of this infrastructure indicates that there is clearly a mobile policy at work that we could observe in Europe and as well in the US. Um, what is strange perhaps is that, and perhaps more research is needed here, is what are the drivers of this mobility? In the US, it is clear that municipalities are learning from each other and the benefits and advantages of um, data center development, such as tax revenue. It's positivistic, um, but it's plain. In the Netherlands and Luxembourg, this mobility is less plain. Um, both claim that data, denser, data center development is key to economic success, but both are also less revealing in the specific flows of, e of economic revenue. Finally, uh, this Janos face seems to be a defining feature of what Rosen and Leon recently coined the digital growth machine, building on and moving beyond the classical notion of, or Logan and Molotov's classical notion of the gro growth machine. Rosen and Leon argue that the digital growth machine is a similar strategy of capturing economic gains, but one that privileges the role of technological firms and in urban development as daily life is increasingly digitized. We know that volumes have been written on the social spatial ramifications of the growth machine, the city as a growth machine. And I can expect that there will be more coming in turn concerning the digital growth machine. We haven't done that here, but what we can say is that maybe we can characterize it. So far in our research, this digital growth machine seems to have two faces, one with the secrecy around failure of symbolic spaces, and one with the secretive mobility around hard infrastructures. And in total, this, this whole thing seems very post-political as is evidenced by the secretive technocratic power brokering all around. So that's what we had to say. Love to hear your questions and comments and feedback. Thank you. <laughs>